Safety costs money. Bad trucking companies, bad actors, don't make that investment in safety. They usually have the worst equipment, and they have bad brakes, they have fatigued drivers, and those are factors right there that if you have a semi coming down the road at highway speed and they don't touch their brakes or their brakes don't work, you're in for a catastrophic collision. I'm attorney Dave Craig, managing partner and one of the founders of the law firm of Craig, Kelly & Fallis. I've represented people who've been seriously injured or who've had a family member killed in a semi or other big truck wreck for over 30 years. Following the wreck, their lives are chaos. Often they don't even know enough about the process to ask the right questions. It is my goal to empower you by providing you with the information you need to protect yourself and your family. In each and every episode, I will interview top experts and professionals that are involved in truck wreck cases. This is After the Crash. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of After the Crash, the podcast that deals with uh, truck wrecks uh, throughout our country and issues dealing with trucks and big trucks, uh, concrete trucks, box trucks, semis, uh, buses, uh, and other commercial motor vehicles. Today, we have a, uh, a special guest, somebody I know extraordinarily well, uh, my uh, partner, Scott Faultless. Scott was one of the founding partners of the law firm of Craig Kelly and Follis. Um, he uh, he has uh, I've known Scott since somewhere around 1990. Him and I started working together, and we've been working together since. Uh, Scott is constantly or consistently recognized uh, by super lawyers uh, as well as the U.S. News best lawyers. Um, he is um, uh, he's won the uh, and has been given uh, presented the prestigious. Sagamore of the Wabash, uh, which is an awarded by the governor of the state of Indiana uh, for people who have been uh, very worthwhile and, and active in the community that make Indiana a better place. Uh, in addition to that, uh, he's a, a board of regent member of the ATAA. Uh, that is the premier trucking group uh, that represents victims of truck wrecks throughout the United States. And in order to be on that board, you have to actually be board certified in truck accident law. Scott is board certified in truck accident law and is one of the few lawyers in the country that is board certified. That's a vetting process that you go through, that, 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 that they go through, that's approved by the ABA, uh, that makes sure that lawyers are actually qualified, experienced uh, in the area of truck work law. Um, there's only less than 100 lawyers that are board certified, and Scott is one of those. In Indiana, there are only four lawyers at the time of this podcast that are board certified in truck accident law. And Scott and I are, are, are two of the four. So um, so uh, that's a, an extraordinarily difficult, challenging thing to do. Um, and I'm proud of the fact that Scott and I both have that recognition. Um, in addition, Scott does a lot of the appellate work. So what he does in our firm, he's, I always say he's the brain of the law firm. Uh, he, uh, he does a lot of our briefs and research uh, but he also is asked on a regular basis to protect the citizens of the state of Indiana uh, by filing briefs and cases that are not even his. So they're cases that are not even Craig Klein Fallows cases, but he's he's asked by other lawyers or, or by the Indiana Trial Lawyers Association to, um, to participate in key important issues uh, to, to help protect the citizens. And these are called what we call amicus briefs. And he regularly files amicus briefs on behalf of people that aren't even his clients. Uh, and so um, he's, he is very active in the, the law of personal injury and specifically very active in the law that deals with truck accidents. Uh, so, Scott, welcome to the, uh, the podcast. Hi, Dave. It's good to be here. Uh, it, I'm glad you finally invited me. <laughs> so, uh, so Scott is, uh, you know, it's always, he's just down the hall. So I get to talk to him all the time. And so, uh, it's good to have him, uh, actually on the podcast. Um, and I think that, you know, um, the podcast is designed for average everyday people, uh, folks who, uh, are not lawyers, um, uh, but sometimes lawyers participate or watch these. And, uh, they'll, I'm sure in today's episode, they'll find, uh, educational and informative, but, the one area that I wanted to talk to Scott about and uh, and have him share his insights was, you know, when there's a catastrophic truck accident and our law firm is called, 
the first question that people want to know is is what happened and why it happened. But 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 as lawyers representing the victims, we have to be concerned about what type of recovery we can make for these people. Oftentimes, it may be the breadwinner of the family, somebody who who, who the family is dependent upon their income to pay their bills, their mortgage, their their uh, all their other all their other expenses. And so the first question is, guys, how do you replace a breadwinner financially? You'll never replace them as a person, but how do you protect, how do you do that financially? And so one of the things you have to look at is insurance coverages um, and, you know, how much money is there available? So let's start off, Scott. Uh, let's talk about insurance coverages. So do truck, uh, commercial motor vehicles, do they carry different types of insurance than what cars do? Yes. Uh, in many states, uh, there, there are relatively low amounts of insurance that the states require you to purchase and have cover your vehicle when you drive so that in case you're in a crash, uh, there's coverage for the person who's harmed. In, in semi cases, uh, it's very different. Um, that amount is, is raised by federal law uh, for interstate commerce cases, and that minimum amount is $750,000. Now, that amount's been in place since almost 1980, so that amount has not changed in over 40 years even though the cost of everything has increased over the course of 40 years, the amount of insurance uh, that trucking companies are required to have as a minimum amount has not changed during that time. So medical bills have increased. The amount of people earn has increased. Um, everything in life has increased except for that minimum amount. And that causes problems, for, in, in, particularly in catastrophic cases. So has there been an attempts to change that uh, law? And and uh, and can you? I, I can guess, and I know who's against it. There have been attempts. There's been numerous attempts, um, both through Congress as well as through the Department of Transportation, which is where Federal Motor Carrier Safety uh, regulations are, are formulated. And not surprisingly, the trucking industry is consistently uh, and uh, against it, both in terms of their lobbying efforts as well as their f financial contributions to members of Congress to oppose it. Uh, they don't want that increased cost, even though when they harm someone, th those costs have increased substantially over the last 40 years. So I just make sure the folks understand. So if there's a, a wreck on the interstate, and unfortunately, let's say there's five cars involved, and there are multiple people, you know, somebody from each vehicle, severely injured, and maybe some people are killed, or is it seven hundred fifty thousand dollars per car? Or how did I mean? How is that? I mean, how is that divvied up amongst all these people that are injured? Well, that's the hard part. Oftentimes, uh, there is not enough insurance coverage to cover all the losses for everyone involved in, in, in a single crash. If, if you using your example, if there's five vehicles, and if, if everyone suffers a serious injury, plus you have their vehicles that were damaged, because that seven fifty thousand dollars covers both. The injury to the your person and or the death, and also the property damage to the vehicles, and so all of a sudden, it, it doesn't take very much, particularly with the with the expensive cars these days, for that seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to be consumed very quickly, and people throughout the entire crash are are grossly undercompensated. So that's not seven hundred fifty thousand dollars per person. No, it's it's for one crash. And that seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. I mean, you and I've had cases where the life care plans, where if somebody's paralyzed, uh, or somebody has a severe brain injury and requires twenty four seven care for the rest of their life, and they're young, that can eat up with the cost of medical treatment, cost of care, twenty four seven care. That can exceed seven hundred fifty thousand dollars today, uh, very easily. Uh, even in cases that are not catastrophic, but yet they they're people people are dealing with lifelong physical problems that are going to require ongoing care, I that can quickly get into exceed the $750,000 by itself. A catastrophic case, I mean, you, uh, the person there is making a fractional recovery of what their, their case is worth. So this insurance limit, the $750,000 that's been there for what well, you said 40 years, that's got to take care of somebody for the rest of their life. So even if you have one person with catastrophic injury, somebody's got to be taken care of for the rest of their life. They don't get to go back and collect more insurance. That's that's it. Well, 
that's 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 my that's where my job comes in is looking for other insurance, other sources of recovery to help cover the loss. Um, and and there's several things we have to do, and and, and really, it's an amazing. The amazing part about all of this is that there are there's a certain group of trucking companies that cause the overwhelming number of crashes on our roads, uh, and I'll call them bad actors. Uh, they they don't do what's required in terms of safety. They they don't maintain their brakes. They don't train their drivers. They don't inspect their tr their tractors and trailers regularly, and so. And the whole world can look at these and, and identify these bad actors because the information online, if you know their DOT number and or their name, you can look up and look at their safety record and get an idea, is this a good or bad trucking company? And the ones that are bad, you can figure out relatively quickly by just simply looking it up on the internet. Anybody can do it. Any insurance company, any shipper, any broker, any other truck company hire them, can look it up and see, is this a bad actor or not? And unfortunately, the bad actors are the one causing a lot of the crashes. And, and I recently read that that like ten percent of the trucking companies out there are causing almost all of the damage and all the wrecks. So I mean, so most trucking companies just make sure people people give us, you know, um, talk to us all the time about well, we're against truckers, or we're against trucking companies, but that's not true. I mean, ninety percent of the companies we believe are safe and and run pretty safe and reasonable operations. And most truck drivers out there are just people who are working hard, who are trying to make a living and take care of their own families. But it's that 10% or less that you're talking about that are really, really bad. And the bad ones are seem to be, at least from my experience after doing this for 38 years, the bad ones seem to be getting worse. They are getting worse. And the bad ones cause the, cause the worst wrecks too, because they usually have the worst equipment and they have bad brakes, they have fatigue drivers, and those are factors right there that if you have a semi coming down the road at highway speed and they don't touch their brakes or their brakes don't work, you're in for a catastrophic collision. And those are the bad trucking companies, uh, typically, that are that are doing that. And so what, what you have is bad actors who, because they have a poor safety record and are a history of crashes, their cost of buying insurance, this minimum amount of $750,000, goes up substantially because they're a bad actor. They're, they're an unsafe trucking company. So what do they do? They they simply change their name from ABC Trucking Company to XYZ Trucking Company. Same trucks, same drivers, same phone number. Everything's the same except for the name. And when they do that, when they get a new name and a, and a new DOT number, Shazam! They have a clean safety record, and that allows them to buy insurance at a much cheaper rate, the $750,000 at a much cheaper rate than what they would have been charged if they simply kept their name and lived up to their safe, their poor safety record. And so in the industry, it's called chameleon carriers. It's the same truck, just a different name, just like a chameleon changes its colors. A chameleon uh, trucking company has just simply changed its name and keeps running these unsafe trucks on our roads, and they get hired, and that's that's the that's where the big problem is because they get hired because they're skimping on the cost of being safe. Good trucking companies invest in their in their drivers. They train them, they retrain them, they coach them, they monitor their performance, they they invest in in good mechanics. Make sure that the trucks and trailers are are are, fit, are sound and safe to be on the road. Those safety costs money. Bad trucking companies, bad actors, don't make that investment in safety. And when they when you do that, you're lowering your cost of you can outbid project, uh, loads against good trucking companies, and that's what happens because. You have it's known within the transportation industry that there's these bad actors that don't spend money on safety and they can outbid the good trucking companies and they get hired by shippers, by other motor carriers to haul their loads and by freight brokers. And that's who we start looking at when we have a bad actor with only seven hundred fifty thousand dollars insurance. And, and we try to figure out is there is there other insurance that may cover this load or other other people who may be responsible for getting this load into this bad trucking companies' hands.
I, I think that, you know, for people to understand, um, I know you and I worked on a case down in Jennings County, um, Indiana, uh, where there was a chameleon carrier. And it was a, so it was a carrier that's bad news, that's dangerous, and it changes its name and, uh, and identity in order to get insurance, in order to get work. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about that case? Sure. I'm, we, we had a case where uh, a, a grandma and grandpa had picked up their granddaughter and were taking her back to their house for a fun evening together. Uh, they were choosing to spend the night with their grandparents. And uh, they were stopped at the bottom of the hill to turn left on their onto their county road to where they their house was. And a semi comes down the hill and they don't have brakes. And it rams into the rear of them, rear of them killing the grandmother and injuring uh, the granddaughter and, and the, uh, the grandfather. Well, come to find out that that particular truck um, uh, earlier that day had been stopped over in, in, in Ohio and the truck driver who had, had that load initially had called the owner of the company say, Hey, th I can hear the brakes hissing. These brakes are not, I can't, I can't lock up the brakes um, to shift my load because the load was out of balance and actually overweight on, on the rear axles. And, and so he told, I'm not driving this. And the, and the owner of the company says, get in the truck, drive this route. He told him the route to take so he wouldn't have to go through any, go past any way stations to be inspected or, or, or weighed. And, and the guy said, no. And we, we had an honest truck driver doing his job properly. But the owner of the company was not a, was a bad actor, and he got in his truck with another guy, drove to, from Mitchell, Indiana, to Ohio, got in the truck, left the, the good truck driver by the curb for to find his own way home, and then he drove the route he he took. He told the other truck truck driver to, to take to avoid way stations and avoid being inspected, and he's driving with bad brakes. He knows it. And then he comes over the hill and he can't stop because he has bad brakes. And so, um, and that's the type of bad characters that, that unfortunately we deal with time and time again in, in, in many of our cases. And, and in that case, you we found out through uh, investigation um, that in fact, that guy had changed his name and that he had, that he was one of these people that the, the government was on the radar uh, of being shut down, and then tell us a little bit about how that, how that, and then why that was a chameleon carrier. So, uh, in the years, in two or three years before this crash, because these type of things build up over time, it, it, they don't happen overnight. It, it takes time to build up. He had been, he'd been actually had a compliance review by the Federal Motor Care Safety uh, uh, Regulators, uh, and they cited him. But he actually had a conditional safety rating um, under his old name, um, and uh, and then finally he got a they they he actually got an unsatisfactory rating, and that meant that he that, that they were going to put him out of business, and uh, and so what he did is that he he gave him some more information, improved a little bit, so that he they could make him conditional safety rating. And that allowed him to keep taking loads. And then roughly two or three months before he knew the next compliance review was coming up, he changed his name, got a, got a clean safety record um, and got new insurance. And uh, But he was at the same facility, same phone number, same trucks, same drivers, same owner. Uh, everything was the same except for the name and the DOT number. And uh, and all of a sudden, uh, Shazam! Uh, he he he's able to pass his his because it's it's a new name. They don't have the same scrutiny, and and then we end up fart with our crash, and this and this family has changed forever. And and in that case, as an example, like one of the things you talked about in the very beginning was that you know your job, one of your jobs, is to try to help us find money. For the victims and their families, and so, um, and so you look at different parties that might be responsible, as well as different insurance contracts that might be on that particular vehicle. But with a chameleon carrier, typically, 
there's going to be $750,000 minimum insurance because these guys are bad actors. And so they, even when they change their name, they still are running low budget operations. So they're buying the minimum insurance. And, but, but sometimes it's not that hard to figure out that ABC company is really the same as old BCD company. Um, and in this case, it really wasn't that hard to figure that out because uh, you did have the same owner and, and even the building still had the old name on, if I remember right. And so, so um, in this case, in that case, for example, I know that you made a case against the broker saying that the broker who put the, the, the trucking company together with the shipper, um, that, that sh they should have some responsibility. And, and so talk a little bit about, I think it's a good segue into, you know, why, why was the broker responsible? When, when is a broker responsible? And how do you figure that out? Um, in, these, in this type of in, in this particular case, well, it, it, broker cases and have they have changed recently? Uh, unfortunately, there's a, a decision out of the United States Circuit Court for the Seventh Circuit, which includes uh, many states, including Indiana, uh, and there's and other circuits have adopted a similar ruling um, that say that you can't sue the, brokers are immune from liability, which means you can't sue them. They're not they're not responsible for their own negligence in hiring and selecting uh, incompetent and unsafe trucking companies. And they say that, that a federal law grants that immunity. Uh, we disagree with that uh, wholeheartedly. The Ninth Circuit uh, a Court of Appeals decision um, says it's different. So we have conflicts between the, the circuits. And unfortunately, the only way that conflict is going to be resolved is from the United States Supreme Court at some point in time. And, that, and, there's, I mean, and this is a perfect example of a case that we were able to recover from the broker, right? Um, and that was prior. It was prior to that case, but we made the arguments and, and said that the broker should have known that this trucking company was bad. And I and I know and in, in for a fact that there are several plaintiff lawyers that are actually truck accident lawyers that are board certified lawyers that are actually fighting that issue and trying to change that. So it's still something we have to look at. Right. Uh, we have to recognize that. You know there are some bad cases out there, but uh, but like Scott said, we you know we're trying. You know there's a there's a certainly a group of really good attorneys out there that like us that are that look at these issues and constantly try to change it because the trucking industry, uh, whether it's the broker, the shipper, the the trucking company, the commercial motor vehicle carriers, they're all working really hard to take away the rights uh, of our of our clients, but. Uh, that's one way to, to sue a, a, a broker. Um, but it, if, if there's potentially claims against a broker, the shipper uh, who actually had manufactured that load and was shipping it somewhere in the United States and or another, a different motor carrier, potentially a di different trucking company. And so you have to look and see how did this truck, how did this load end up at on this truck at this time? And you have to trace all the documents back all the way to the beginning point where the shipper was and find out who touched this load, who had contractual responsibility for this load, who had contractual responsibility to make sure that there was insurance to provide uh, coverage. And so you have to track all these documents back. You have to follow the money, so to speak, um, and, and follow all the documents back and see and get all the contracts. Did the shipper have a contract with a really big trucking company to haul all of its loads all across the country um, and look at that contract to see, did they bind themselves to transport every load tendered to it? And did they accept the load? And then the, did they throw it off, throw that load off to a different motor carrier? Because for a variety of reasons, they can't, they didn't have enough drivers. They didn't have enough uh, tractors. And they said, here, can you just haul this load for us? And they get a lower bid than what they, than what they're contractually uh, getting paid by the shipper, and so they skim the profits uh, off the load, and and they and they give it to the load to uh, the bad actor, the motor carrier who can give a cheap quote, um, and so that we look and see, can we go after that company uh, if that company exists, um, uh, who had a contract with the shipper? Can we go after them? Did did the freight broker who who had a contract with the shipper, did they hold themselves out as a, a trucking company? And did they bind themselves out and say, we'll transport this load for you? 
And did they make representations in their contract and agree to tr accept that load and bind themselves to do it? Because if they did, then they could be responsible as well. Um, is the shipper uh, the a, a different motor carrier or the broker? Are they exerting control over this driver? Are they telling the driver, you have to go here, you have to do this? Yeah, and they're at, in essence at, using that driver as their employee or agent, and they're exerting control enough to be responsible as an employer or a, a, a principal. And so we have to look at all these things, uh, gather up all the documents, all the emails to the driver, the text messages between the the, the shippers and or the, the the trucking companies and or the freight brokers, and try to figure out is there someone else who could be responsible for this bad actor's conduct because they, they're the ones who put them on the road. And, and I think that's for the average everyday person who's listening to this, who may have a loved one or a family member who's been killed or seriously injured in a semi-wreck. Um, you know, whether it's us or they hire someone else, um, I think it's important for them to understand that this is not something that personal injury lawyers deal with day in and day out. These aren't issues that you have with car wrecks, typically. Um, these are sophisticated um, questions that really you have to be a truck accident lawyer to understand. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And there, there's, unfortunately, there's a lot of attorneys out there who say, stand on the semis and act like they're truck lawyers and everything I just described, they've never even thought about. And so, um, you know, it, it takes time. Unfortunately, everything I, I just described in terms of following the documents, following the money, figuring out who got paid, who, who submitted the bills to the shipper, who, who how much did they submit for, how much did they how much profit did they make, how much money was paid to everybody else. All that unfortunately takes time. And then you have to read the doc and say, did they, were they required to have insurance? Did they, were they required to have an excess or an umbrella policy uh in the, by by contract? And, and and or did one of the motor carriers promise to insure liability for the for the load? Uh, and so you have to read all these documents. And unfortunately, it takes a ton of time uh, and and threats to force trucking companies and all these players to give us the documents so we can read them and understand them and figure out before the statute of limitations runs if there's anybody else that should be involved in this lawsuit. So for you folks out there that, that may not know, statute of limitation is every state has a period of time in which you can sue them. In some states, it's two years. In some states, it's five years. Or it can be anywhere. It can be any number. But if you some don't states, bring your some states is one. Some states is one year. And so if you don't bring your case within the statute of limitations, you never are allowed to recover for any harm, no matter how bad it is. Um, and so I think that you know, so from a, from as experienced truck wreck acts, truck wreck lawyers. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that jump out at me is, first of all, what Scott's talking about is it takes a long time and you have to fight because not, none of these companies want to give this information to you voluntarily. And, and so they don't want to have to pay what could be millions or tens of millions of dollars. And so they will fight you. And so you have to get the documents and you have to understand the documents. You have to, you have to be able to read the documents. You have to be able to consult with experts that are in this area to understand whether you have a case or not. Um, and so that's a big part of it and it takes time. And so, but if you don't have the right attorney, they never even know to go look for those documents. And the saddest thing that Scott and I see are cases where lawyers have settled it for the 750,000. And then they, they're, they're saying that's all the insurance there is. When in fact, there were millions or tens of millions of dollars that was really available and families come out with a really bad result and sometimes don't even know it until they ask the question or we, or, you know, they, and then it's too late, uh, which is really sad. Um, and so the other thing about it is, is that some of the people you're talking about that might be responsible, for example, the shipper, the law uh, in most states is pretty tough to hold a shipper responsible, hold a shipper liable. And so even if you, so in order to say, okay, what Scott and I do when we sit down, when we get a trucking case, is we like and say, okay, who all might be responsible? What team of experts do we need to put together to protect our clients? And the sooner we get hired, the easier that the easier that is. But you and I both have worked on cases where 
a shipper has been involved or a mechanical issue has risen, that if we didn't get hired quick enough, or if they hired a lawyer who didn't understand these issues, evidence would have been a lost and a, and a full recovery could not have been obtained. Yeah, I, I, one example of a uh, negligent shipping case, which involved that the negligent securement of the load, that the shipper actually put the product on the trailer, uh, screwed and nailed uh, uh, dunnage around the load on the flatbed trailer uh, to help secure it. And they did a bad job putting the dunnage down and securing it. Actually did a very poor job. It was negligent. Um, and it was hidden in such a way that the driver uh, couldn't see that they were doing a poor job. Uh, and the driver takes off and his load starts becoming loose because they did a poor job securing it to the trailer. Um, and he comes to stop on the interstate over the crest of a hill. And so, and unfortunately, uh, there, a crash occurs. And so for that, you have to you have to, to prove that case to show that that the load was improperly secured, you have to be hired almost immediately, make sure the, tr the trailer is is secured. So when it comes time to actually unload the trailer to shift the load to a different trailer so it can be taken on its journey, you can then inspect the dunnage to see how how it was improperly or properly um, secured the load. And we actually, in that case, we actually had a videographer present uh, to visit and record every, the, everything of unloading that load and showing that the dunnage and which is blocks of wood was was were not secure. And that explained why the load shifted and why the truck driver had to come to, to a stop. So, and I, and I think that's critical. I mean, so you know, in that case, where we were hired quickly. Um, I went out and met the the widow the day after the wreck because another family member and a, a friend of the family had recommended they hire us because they knew we did trucking law. And um, but not only did we go out and inspect the vehicle, we had somebody watch the vehicle to make sure they didn't start the unloading process until we got there. But we also had experts there with us at the scene. We had a videographer there at the scene, and all and 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 in fact, this was a bad carrier, the bad truck driver who had only $750,000 worth of insurance or a million. I mean, he may have had a million, but I had a million. Um, and so some some companies will only sell a minimum of a million instead of 750. But this guy was a bad cut driver, horrible driver. He only had a million dollars worth of insurance and a million dollars wasn't sufficient for the death of a husband. It was a husband who had uh, young girls in college. And so that was not sufficient nor ever would be sufficient and so financially, and so um, it was critical that we get collect for the family more than the million dollars. And this is a case that we were able to collect more money from the shipper than we were from the trucking company. So the shipper had more insurance. So, you know, and, and unfortunately, a lot of lawyers would have moved slow. They wouldn't have been out there. They wouldn't have found out because they tried to unload that load earlier before they told us the time they told us. And they would have missed out on all that. And the family would have been stuck with the million dollar coverage. So and, time is of the essence. And remember, in that case, the shipper who actually had, had was filling an order for a customer, that customer wanted that product right, right now. They, they were on a timeline and on a construction project, and they needed those construction materials today. And so we were getting pressure from everybody. Well, you got to release this trailer because it has to be unloaded and 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 move, moved on because this is this is there's like a hundred thousand dollars of product on this trailer. And so we're getting pressure from everybody, and we just kept saying no. And if you don't preserve it, we'll go to court and we'll get a court order preserving it. Until we until we have everything that we that we need to pro do a proper inspection and preserve the evidence, and, and we've done the same thing on mechanical issues. We've had cases where um, we found that there were problems with the, and we got hired quickly. We were able to do inspections. Those inspections turned out where we were able to find problems with the vehicle, 
uh, which then led us to other other possible defendants. We've also had trucking companies who later blamed other mechanical issues on other folks. And so sometimes the maintenance of a truck can come into question. And so even that can create a liability for someone else that can help us recover for the clients by going after these people who did improper maintenance of the vehicle. Correct. And we, we, we've had a case where the kingpin came off the, the fifth wheel, which is that's the, the, the device that the trailer hook, latches onto so that the tractor can pull it. And it, it was, it came, the load came from South Texas where it's, they don't see a whole lot of freezing weather. And the, and the crash occurred in uh, Northern Indiana where there, there's in wintertime and it was freezing and they didn't properly grease the fifth wheel so that it would proper uh, function properly and latch onto the kingpin. And when they, when the truck driver literally pulls out of the, the shipper's driveway onto a highway he loses his trailer because it didn't, it wasn't properly maintained. Um, and um, it causes a very severe crash. The guy had, the guy suffered lifelong uh, catastrophic injuries. And so getting involved quickly, be able to inspect that fifth wheel. Um, and then we actually purchase a fifth wheel, uh, the same make and model to show how, so, it, to, 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 so we can present to a jury to show how it's supposed to properly be greased and how it's supposed to properly function. Um, and what everybody did wrong, but they were blaming one of the, the third party uh, mechanics that they had hired to maintain the equipment. And so that's something we had to know uh, early on in the case so we could bring him into it if we needed to. So, I mean, that one, the, the, it's critical for folks to understand that you need to hire a qualified attorney. Um, so to so ask them, you know, do you have you done truck record accidents? Are you board certified in truck accident law? Um, how have you have ever gone to trial in a truck wreck case? Um, and because you have to look at the shipper, the broker, the uh, motor carriers, you have to look, you have to do the follow the paper trail. Um, you have to do your investigation, hire the right experts and examine the, the, the ship, the, the truck and all the equipment uh, quickly. Um, and you have to have lawyers who understand that, who aren't looking for the easy, quick settlement you have to look for lawyers who are looking out for your interest, who are trying to maximize results of your clients. And that's just in the shipping world. That's that's in the transportation world. So what we've talked about are shippers, brokers, motor carriers, trucking companies, drivers. We've talked about, you know, uh, mechanics of people who keep the trucks running, maintenance. But on top of that, there are often other people involved in wrecks that can also be responsible. We have handled every year, unfortunately, we get hired on construction zone wrecks. Every single year, there's construction where semis plow into the back of people in construction zones and either kills them or severely injures them or both. And in that case, another issue is, is someone else, is the construction zone, for example, is there a contract or a subcontract or is the government who else might be responsible for this loss other than just the truck driver? Because again, the truck driver may only have 750,000 or a million. And again, it's usually the bad truckers that are the ones that are causing these wrecks in the construction zone. So they may have minimum insurance and that insurance, if it's multiple vehicles, which oftentimes it is, is never sufficient. Yeah. And, <laughs> Construction zones are, in my opinion, one of the da most dangerous places you can stretch the roadway you can be in. Period, um, of a, as a motorist. And this is why I actually tell my own kids: if you're in a construction zone, or near a construction zone, or if you're on an interstate and you come to a stop, if you come to a stop, make sure you you're in the in the if it's if if possible, make sure you're in the lane where you have an out. Or, and you make sure you leave enough space between the car in front of you, so that in case and keep and then keep your eyes on the rearview mirror, and watch for truck drivers who are not paying any attention or asleep or um, on their cell phone, uh, and and if they're not slowing down, just take off and 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 go into the ditch to avoid being hit by a 60, 70 mile an hour truck who's not paying any attention, and and. 
And I, and I tell that to all my kids and anybody that, that will listen to me to make sure, because it's happened so many times in construction zones where trucks literally just run into a line of cars because either the driver's asleep, uh, the driver's fatigued and half asleep, uh, which is the same thing as drunk driving, um, and or the, the truck driver's on their cell phone not paying any attention. And so, and, and you have to look at the construction zone itself to see if the truck driver was alert, was there something actually wrong with the construction zone that was a contributing factor in the, in the crash, such as was there a, actually a, an area that people could get out of the out of the travel lane if they're experiencing mechanic problems? Uh, and so there's there's a variety of issues you have to look at from the construction zone, and construction zones change almost daily, and so you, you have to get out there and and to have someone videotape and photograph the construction zone as soon as possible to make sure it hasn't changed because they move barrels, they move they move stripes, they move the, the barriers, things move in construction zones. So you have to get out there quickly to preserve evidence to even figure out, was it improperly signed? Was it improperly marked? Um, uh, and, and things of that nature to see if there is more responsibility out there. And again, if it's a family member or a, or a friend of someone who's a victim of one of these wrecks in a, in a work zone or construction zone, it's critical that you hire an experienced truck wreck attorney quickly so that they can go out and preserve this evidence. And we have, we literally go out and have, we had a, a fatality. I mean, several people died down in Kentucky and we actually sent a, a scanning a truck with a big giant scanner on the back of it. And it scanned the entire construction zone. We shot it from the air. We shot it from the ground. We shot it every which way you can imagine. We have sued the, the government. We've sued the construction companies. We've sued the contractors in construction zone cases and have cases pending right now against those type of folks uh, for improper negligence construction zones. But again, those things do change quickly. Uh, and uh, you've got to move quick. And you've got to have attorneys that are looking for that rather than lawyers who just look at it and say, guys, there's $750,000 available. So let's, let me settle this case. Sorry, there's nothing else we can do. You've got to look for what else can you do? How do you maximize the recovery for the clients who certainly deserve it? Um, and, and one other tip that I would say that Scott didn't talk about that I tell my kids, um, not only do you have to watch your mirror, but if you're approaching a construction zone, you don't want to be that car in the back of the line. Unfortunately, semi-drivers plow into the back, and if you happen to be the one in the back, then your odds of surviving are decreased. So I say when you start seeing construction zone signs, you want to start push it, positioning yourself so you don't have a semi in front of you and you don't have a semi behind you. The reason you don't want a semi in front of you is because you could be knocked underneath the semi. And so you want to leave plenty of room in the vehicle in front of you, and you have control over that. But if you're in the back of the line, it's tough. And sometimes you don't have an out. Most of the times you do, sometimes you don't. But if you push it, position your car in, in enough vehicles, enough cars behind you, then you at least increase your odds of not being one of the ones that's hit. So it's sad, um, but not only do we see, we see you know people that are drivers that are tired, um, that, that fall asleep. We have drivers that are distracted. I mean, the distraction is more than just the use of the cell phones. I mean, they have a lot of electronic stuff inside these tractors, semi-tractors now, that require them to talk, move, look down, take their eyes off the road, GPS. You know, I mean, there's so much stuff inside these tractors and that can cause them distracted. Uh, some drivers, they, I mean, they live in, their, in these semi-tractors. So they might be eating. They might, you know, they might be doing a variety of things that cause them to be distracted, to plow into the back of, of the vehicles. Uh, and the maintenance, and sometimes the trucks are not, the brakes are not properly maintained. So they plow into the back because they're unable to stop. We've seen drivers using cruise control in construction zones or going into construction zones. At extra, night. At night, which is extraordinarily dangerous. So um, so there's so many different factors that can, can come into play. There's, there's multiple people who can be responsible for a wreck. And so the key is you hire somebody and then you have you hope that the law firm has somebody like Scott who can go through and sort through all this, follow the paper trail so that you can find out everybody that is possibly responsible because all of those folks should be held accountable. 
Scott, is there anything else that we haven't covered uh, that as far as finding other parties and, and insurance policies? Uh, the only thing that maybe this is one way to just wrap up is that, you know, oftentimes a, a truck driver is driving his, his or her truck or their tractor, but they're pulling someone else's trailer. Uh, and the trailer may be owned by a shipper, may be owned by a different trucking company, um, and uh, they may not have a lease on that truck they, or that trailer, excuse me. And so if, if that's the case, there's almost always going to be insurance on the trailer itself. And then you need to make sure you read that, get that policy that covered that trailer from the shipper and or the other motor carrier and see, does that trailer policy also provide coverage for this crash? And 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 that's definitely very important to do uh, on cases where the the they don't match up the tractor and the trailer the leases and the ownership don't match up and you've got to track that track track that paper trail uh, as well and get those documents. Great advice. Uh, so you've been listening to after the crash. Thank you for uh, for listening and and uh, hopefully you'll continue to follow us. Hopefully you'll like us and follow us on uh, um, YouTube. Uh, or you can listen to us uh, on any of the other uh, places you listen to your podcast. But, you know, hopefully you would like to watch us. Uh, so go to YouTube. So thanks. Everybody have a great day and be safe out there. This is David Craig, and you've been listening to After the Crash. If you'd like more information about me or my law firm, please go to our website, ckflaw.com. Or if you'd like to talk to me, you can call 1-800-ASK-DAVID. If you would like a guide on what to do after a truck wreck, then pick up my book, Semi-Truck Wreck, A Guide for Victims and Their Families, which is available on Amazon, or you can download it for free on our website, ckflaw.com.